Are you ready to get the hydrofacial glow? Loved in 87 countries across the world. It's not a facial, it's a hydrofacial. Now available across the UK. Visit hydrofacial.co.uk to find your nearest location. Right, I'm going to find out all about the music business. And after six months there, I was like, I'm ready. <laughs> I've got this handful of songs. I now know people in the business. Great. So I'm going to pack in my job and sign a record deal. So I packed in my job and cleaned off his floors for two years because nobody wanted to sign <laughs> it. Hello. Hey. Hi. A little birdie told me that it's somebody's birthday today. <laughs> Who could Ooh. that be? I think it begins with a D and it's not me. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Have you had a wonderful day, darling? Yes, so far I have. But I didn't get the, the red memo. Oh. Oh, <laughs> what happened? You, <laughs> you look lovely. Oh. Sherry, Thank can you. you give me a twirl? I love, always love for your jackets. Can, you, can we see you? Yes, Just please. Me. It's got white buttons. Oh, I remember oh. that. Your, nip your yeah. nipples jacket, isn't it? Well, it, uh, all my jackets are exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> Except your different colour. <laughs> this one's very worn out because I've worn it to death. Because I just love the colour, so I have to get a new one, I'm afraid. Sorry, jacket. <laughs> oh. I want to go into your wardrobe. That would be a nice birthday present for me. Big, many what jackets. Many mm. jackets. Yeah, I'd and like a sherry, a sherry makeover. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, that would be a good one, actually. Listen, so for, for my birthday, who have you got for me? Hmm? Well, Ooh. Dee is the most wonderful person. Come on, Dee. Oh, he, he is a wonderful person. I mean, he's had big hits, um, hit records. He's a very inspirational mentor and, and vocal coach. Um, you, you remember him from Pop Idol. And Fame Academy, and he's the, the amazing David Grant. Hi! Hello! David! Hello. Oh, David, it's so wonderful that you've flown into the nest. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. Oh, and what, wow. and what a nest it is, decorated by three beauteous women. Oh, oh you say all the right things. Schmooza! Schmooza! <laughs> <laughs> well, darling, I have to say, you have had and are still having the most amazing career with big hits and and you know voice coaching all sorts of stuff how did it all begin for you with your, well, your fabulous voice well do you know what it's it's interesting because um i want to say right at the beginning that it started in the 80s and in the 80s when you looked at people like you know, like the Rolling Stones, say, or, or, or the Beatles, or, or even, even Rod Stewart, people like that. You think, gosh, if somebody's had a career in the business in any capacity that had lasted for more than half a dozen years, it was a shock. That was like a lifetime because people just came and went and came and went. And once they'd gone, you didn't really see them again. And um, so to be still sort of connected with music, to still be in the business after all this time, is such a privilege. It's such a delight, and it's not something that I ever anticipated was going to happen. It's, uh, it's gone beyond my wildest dreams. And the reason it's gone beyond my wildest dreams is because to start with, I didn't know anybody in the business. I was desperate to get in. I was desperate to make music. And I didn't know a single person who was engaged. I knew DJs because I went clubbing, but I didn't know. Yeah. So I had a record shop. A group walked in one day and asked if they could rehearse in the back room. We had a great big storeroom and not much stock. So we said, yeah. So they started rehearsing and they were a group called Light of the World. You then got a record deal and turned out to be really successful. I was desperate to get in the band, but they didn't want me. <laughs> we, had a, we had a guy who was, a, it was a, the shop assistant who played guitar and wrote songs. And he started a group called Incognito that went on to be really successful. I wanted to be in the band, but they didn't want me. So what happened was at the time I thought, right, I'm going to start a band. I'm going to join a band. I auditioned for over 20 bands, none of whom wanted me. Um, <laughs> and then thought, this really isn't working. So I've got two options, give up 
or start my own. And of course, there was only ever one that I was going to take. So I started my own band and, and it was called Lynx. And we tried to get a record deal and nobody wanted to sign us. And in the <laughs> end, after two years of, I, I was a journalist and I was a trainee journalist. And I thought, right, I know how to get into the music business. I'm going to look for a job in a record company. So I became, I became the press office assistant to Island Records, gave up my job in the local paper and thought, right, I'm going to find out all about the music business. And after six months there, I was like, I'm ready. I've got this handful of songs. I now know people in the business. Great. So I'm going to pack in my job and sign a record deal. So I packed in my job and cleaned office floors for two years because nobody wanted to sign me. <laughs> Oh, in, oh, the end, obvious, obvious. in the end, D, we met a guy who was working at a music publisher's one person who really thought we were good, but just didn't have a song. And we came in with a song on a cassette. Do you remember those that we'd we yeah. got in the middle of a room and played it to him? And because he'd listened to all our demos and went, no, no, no. And we played him this rough cassette and he said, that's the one. That's a hit go and record it, we said, we haven't got any money. So he lent us a thousand pounds. Wow. And with that thousand pounds, we recorded- A lot then, yeah. A lot then in 1980, we recorded yeah. our first single. We did an instrumental for the B-side because we didn't have enough to record two songs. <laughs> that was an instrumental of the same song. We <laughs> pressed a thousand copies they got into the hands of some DJs who started playing them. And suddenly all the record companies that had turned us down wanted to sign us. So it was actually, it's a tale of sheer bloody mindedness yeah. driven by ignorance. Because wow. if we'd have been smart, we'd have said, if all these people are saying we can't do it, clearly it's because we're not any good, but we were too ignorant to actually grasp yeah. the fact that they were telling us to go and do something else. It's just because they had a set idea of what people wanted. Absolutely. So you were coming in with something different. And that's that's true with every aspect of our business, it's I think. so but, true, yeah. Debbie. What I've learned over the years, and I'm sure, you know, you, you guys probably learned a lot quicker than me because you're smarter than me, is that when somebody says you can't, it simply means you can't with them. Yeah. It doesn't mean there's not yeah. somebody else out there who's going to say, I get it. I see what you're trying to do. Let's Let's do it. Yeah. Oh. And the, the you can't bit, I think, as well, is because they couldn't. They weren't Absolutely. able to. Awesome. So, so when someone else can't do it, it's what I always say to my kids. There is always, always a way to do something if you really want it. Mm. Yes, absolutely. And I think that, you know, it's what is it that Einstein said that genius is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration? perspiration. And it really is. And you know, you look, around, you look around the business and it's full of talented people who have really had to fight to get in and then stay in. Yeah, absolutely. Often people don't have a vision, you know, or should I say they don't have your vision. As an actor, you know, when, when we used to go in to meet people and they go, no, you're not what not what I vision. And I and I remember going into one and saying why. And he went, Well, we want somebody. I was dark then. We want somebody blonde. I could be blonde, or we want <laughs> taller. I could be taller. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> the vision they have in their head as you walk in that room, and it's not their vision. But yeah. you can change that, which is exactly what you did. Exactly, and what I, I think what, what a lot of people don't seem to realise is that most artists are incredibly resourceful. If yeah. you say to an actor, we're looking for somebody who can ride a horse and play a banjo, they will <laughs> learn to ride a horse and play a banjo. That minute. That minute. Absolutely right. The question is, can you act? It should be, can yes. you do it, rather than, can you tick all these boxes? Because people right. learn to tick boxes. Yeah. You're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if it's the same in the music industry, but unfortunately now in the acting industry, everything is done with self tapes, and, yeah. and and therefore as actors, we 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 like being directed, we like being told how to play a scene, and left to us, we're just giving them what we think is right as opposed to what they think is right, it and is I right. think it's completely diluted the business. Don't you agree, girls? Yeah, yeah. diluted. Absolutely. And also the music 
music, the music industry has changed so much, hasn't it, David? Oh, the music industry has changed beyond all recognition in as much as I think that people listen less with their ears now and more with their, their phones, their tablets and their computers. Yeah. You, mm. you listen to a track and you see how many views has it had? How many followers do they have? Whereas it used to be that if you were good and if somebody thought your music was good, it was their job to find your market. It yeah. was their job to help mm -hmm. you build your market. And it was their job to stand with you and create an audience. Now, most people want to see what audience you have created. And if mm -hmm. it's big enough, they're interested. And if it isn't, they're not. Unless you've done the work, they're <laughs> not interested. Do you know, it's interesting, programs like The X Factor, I think what happened with TV talent shows in the noughties is that the dial shifted. And let me explain what I mean. When TV talent shows began, like Pop Idol, Fame Academy, the idea was that you found talent. Yes. And how successful that show was, wasn't perceived by the viewing figures. It was perceived by how successful the artists that won became. Yes. Because the objective was to find talent. And if the talent was successful, the show was considered yeah. successful. Mm -hmm. Over the course of time, what's happened is that those shows have become music entertainment shows, where actually it's like, you know, I'm watching The Voice with my back, I'm at home and I'm watching with my back to the screen, would I turn for this? <laughs> and if the answer is yes, then great, it's entertainment. Nobody cares how well the artists do when they're finished. They don't even, that's not even a consideration I anymore. Yeah. I mean, on The Voice, they don't win anything, do they? Well, they win a record deal. But oh, they, they, yeah, exactly the same as X Factor. They win a record deal. But the point is, you've got your record deal. But if, if you were successful because at six o'clock or seven o'clock every Saturday, you were in people's homes, which is one of the great things about TV, as opposed to film or, 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 or you know, cinema or concerts, we know people because they're in our houses. Yes. If you're a TV person, it's much more personal. If I want to see a Tom Cruise movie, I may have to go out, I'll queue up at the cinema, I'll buy my popcorn and my drink and I'll go and watch. If I want to see you, any of you on TV, I'll sit in my space on my sofa with my food or my drink and watch you in my home. It's much more personal. Yeah. And so if I've been watching you singing in my home and loving it, that does not mean that I'm going to want your record. Yes. Yeah. True, isn't it? Yeah. So what do you think should change then? I'd love to see a talent show where it was about the talent rather than about the presentation, rather than about the judges. Yes. And one of the things that we've learned from talent shows is that if the judges are entertaining and if the act is entertaining, then any longevity they have is irrelevant. And I think that that's a bit of a shame as well because, because for so many of those artists, this is their break, this is their moment. They've been working really hard to get to a point where they can stand up on the TV in front of millions of people and actually perform. And if, if the, the sum total of their value is that they pull in people on a Saturday night, but it's not about the music, it's not about the career, it's not about any ongoing development, then actually I think that that diminishes the whole thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Because, but, but even so, like in the 80s, was it the 80s? It could have even been the 70s. Uh, search for it, was it Search for a Star? All of those sort of things. Well, there was New Faces. New Faces. Yeah. yeah. Even though Tony Hatch, was, yeah, Tony Hatch was kind of like Simon Cowell. Yes. But mm. the artists that won became big stars. Yes. Absolutely right. They became big stars because the objective was to help them become big stars. Yes. It wasn't the, you know, when the lights went out on the last show and the ticker tape has gone up and the winner's been celebrated, that people go, thank you very much. It's been a great couple of months. Have a good life. It was <laughs> the, the end of the series was the beginning of a career, not the end of it. Yeah. yeah, this is a really absolutely. good, absolutely. Because I, I haven't really thought about that. Had you girls, I mean, 
it, I have noticed that actually people who win, sometimes you don't hear about them again. And it's people that haven't won that make the success of their careers, which is, yes. yeah, always. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, it's amazing when you think that, you know, you look at X Factor, Oli Mers didn't win. No. One Direction didn't win. No, they didn't. But actually, you know, the public, the public speak, the public go, well, I, I like you, I connected with you. And somehow, maybe because of management or whatever, their careers began to flourish after the event. And yeah. so, many, so many of the winners, it's like, I think it's a terrible thing and a terrible shame when the high point of somebody's career is the moment that it should be beginning. I mean, imagine this is my first TV show and I'm in a series and the high point is I've got loads of script on my first episode and then I'm not seen again for the rest of the series. <laughs> exactly. That's it. It's true. I mean, and, and, and then someone says, actually, that's not just it for the series. That's your career. <laughs> It's true, it's true, Dave. So now we're going to, uh, this is going to be a first on Wonderbirds, we are now going to create on this show, right at this moment, a new format for a talent show, which we are all going to be judges. Right. So Absolutely. I mean, where does it go at the end? We've now established our best, but how do we establish who the best artist is? I mean, that, that's it. So what's the, how does it work now in your head? Well, in my head, I think this idea that the public speak, I love the idea that the public get a vote. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, there was a Euro, the Eurovision idea, which is that the judges actually judge and the public get a vote. Yeah. It's a combination of the two. Yeah. I, yeah. Think that's, I think that's really good. And the reason I think that's really good is because there are some people who I love on TV who I... My favourite TV star, I'm not going to buy their album. If somebody jumps onto TV and jumps out of the screen and you go, you know what it's like when you're watching somebody, some people jump out of the screen at you. Mm -hmm. And you don't know why it is. It's not necessarily that they're, they're, they're the best person, but they have a connection. Okay, yes. That's what makes, that's to me, the difference between a star and somebody who's really good. That yeah. person who, for whatever reason, it's usually intangible. That's why it's called the X Factor. That's, you know, it's, it's the je ne sais quoi. It's the, I don't know why, but they just do it. So if you're in a room and you're seeing it, it might not connect, but on screen at home, uh, really connects. I don't know if you've ever done this, but I was speaking to a friend of mine who's an actor who said that they were watching, um, oh, uh, Sean Bean. They were in um, a program with Sean Bean. And they said they were standing with the directors. They were standing like behind, watching it on the screen, his scene. And they were going like this, looking at the screen and going, movie star. Looking up and going, actor. Looking at the screen and going, movie star. I said it was extraordinary. In the room, you go, he's acting really well. You yeah. look at it on a screen, on any screen, and it's like, pow. Yeah. That is amazing. Now, yeah. That's why I think you need the combination because I've sat in a judge's chair and then watched it later and gone, gosh, I missed that. Yeah. I didn't, I yeah. Didn't see that in the flesh. This person really jumps out. So I think there should be a combination. And then there should be some guarantee of musical commitment from a record company, not just trying to shoehorn this person into a style, but finding mm -hmm. out who they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll ask you a question. When you first, did you used to watch The X Factor, guys? Yeah. yeah. Okay. When you first saw One Direction in their auditions, did anyone jump out? Harry. 100%. He did. I was watching yeah. it going, yeah. And Carrie and I looked at each other and went, that kid, because he was a kid at the time, he was 17, mm -hmm. that kid's a star. Ah. Uh -huh. He wasn't the best singer necessarily. He looked slightly awkward in his movements, yeah. but you can't bottle or define charisma. Some people have it. Yeah, well, I remember seeing Will Young on the, uh, what, what was the show before The X Factor? I it, was, it was uh, Pop Idol. 
pop idol. And I remember thinking, you know, I knew they were going for Gareth Gates, but for me, Will Young was was the one, oh, yeah. always the one. His voice was unusual. He had something special about him. I know Simon had that thing, but he's had the career. Yeah. I mean, we worked on that show and you're absolutely right. In fact, interestingly enough, Kate Thornton presented the Pop Idol 2, which was the kind of the making of shows that they used to do in those days. And of all the contestants we had coming through, Will was the only one. She walked up in front of him at the beginning of his uh, rehearsals with Carrie and I um, and said, well, we don't know who the winner's going to be. It could be any one of our contestants. It could be William Young here. Can you believe that? Uh, wow. Wow. That was before they'd even sung. Anyone had sung in front of the judges. Amazing. I remember him taking Simon on. And people remember that as well. Yeah. yeah. Did you remember there was a, there was the most incredible program that they stopped doing, and it was like a glee, like a Glee workshop that they found kids in. Did you ever see that? No, tell me about yes, that. I did. Oh, yes. well, I can't remember what it was called. Oh, it yes. Hold was, on. Hold on. It was called no, the Glee Project. Yes, I it was. Was it, it called, was. was it called Glee Club? No, Glee Project. Project. Right, okay. It was. Absolutely fantastic. It really was. And the people, I mean, it was the guy who who started Glee, what's his name? He's a wonderful director and producer. Oh, Ryan somebody. Yes. Yes. It, it was him. And how he worked with the with the kids, because they were kids, and they would they would be working on their own, and then they would come and they would sing for him, and then they would do a sort of little show, and then they'd go to the next round, the same kind of thing. But what he used to say when they'd finished singing, because it was just him in a studio with, with a choreographer and somebody else, a, a casting director. And they would give everybody pointers that they thought that they should, they needed. It was, it was fantastic. And some of the kids who came on and said, you know, they actually were very nervous. They would say to them, you are wonderful. You have so much talent, but you must remember, they were, they really, get to everybody they weren't critical or, or sometimes they would say I hear that you have been not very nice to somebody else or you've been holding back and not telling people you know if somebody asked you something and that is not the way to be in our business you have got to give and you've got to give you know we're giving you so you must give back it was, it was just brilliant but you know what's interesting about that is is Debbie the, the, they were developing them and yes. I think this ties into the talent show thing as well. I mean, I don't know about any of you because, as I say, you're probably a lot smarter than me, but I think it was about four or five years before I felt like I even knew what I was doing. Like I felt confidently like I'm in the business and, and I know how to do this. It's not just that I've been cast. And, and I think that I think for a lot of young people, when you get on talent shows, in fact, for a lot of young people in any stage of the career early on, if you have been successful, if your career has ignited in any way, there is a sense that there's a weight of expectation on you that internally you may not actually feel confident enough to carry that weight, but you can't dare show it, which is why so many artists have imposter syndrome. Now, I think that one of the things that would help with a talent show is if when the cameras stop rolling and the lights are switched off and the series was finished, that the same people that have been helping to mentor, advise and develop this artist stayed with them. The way that back in the day, a good agent would. A good agent would sit you down and tell you when you were doing stuff that was wrong and tell you when you were in danger of losing the gig because of your attitude or tell you when you were better than you thought you were. Well, isn't it? Into the business. Absolutely. It's Otherwise, we'd be thrown to the wall. With the Glee project, David, what they did was to to for the auditions for the you know like that sort of as they were going to the next phase, they brought people in from Glee to work wow. with them, right, and with, then the, yeah. the winner won a part in Glee. But three of them were so good that they gave three of them the part in Glee. But the one that didn't win became the regular character again. But they worked, they worked with the cast, they saw how the cast worked, they worked with the choreographer and had to get dancers ready with him. So they were working their way to something. I wanted to say to you, uh, David, about your um, voice coaching. Oh, okay. I love that. Um, do, you, do you do it every day? 
<laughs> don't do it every day, but I do it every week. I do it a few days of every week. Because to me, the voice coaching is brilliant. I love the voice and Carrie and I are both obsessed with the voice. But even more than that, it's about helping people at whatever stage of their career to realize the gold that they have in them. And jointly, them and us, we mine for that gold. Yes. And do you ever have anybody where you say, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what the only times that I've ever felt like I need to say something to somebody and there have been occasions it's not been because they can't sing because I believe that every if you can talk you can sing okay, okay. I believe that um because tone deafness is is what it says it's like an inability to hear yeah yeah hear pitch it's not singing it's about your hearing um, and there are some people that have got that. But even then, I've been able to work with people with that and improve massively their ability to hear pitch. It's when people walk in and say, I've got, well, you're looking at Ford talent and you go, this is going to be really good. And they have Rolls Royce expectations. <laughs> and, you know, it's about managing sometimes people's expectations. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how good they get, even if they fulfill their own potential, they'll always fall short and feel disappointed because nobody said to them, look, you can't be this, but you can be this. If you're the best. If you're the best at this, it's amazing what you can achieve. We've run out of time. Of course we have. We have so much. We haven't even talked about your book or everything. Will you come back again? For I'd love to come back. You guys are so fascinating. <laughs> I'd love to come back. Thank you so much for having me. I feel oh, like I'm Thank you. You want my birthday present, actually. Oh, thank you. And happy <laughs> birthday, Debbie. I feel as though I have spent the afternoon in elite company. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh. At we least we're Rolls too, Royces David. and not Fords, hopefully. Oh, no. <laughs> All Rolls Royces, I'm telling you. <laughs> Top of the range. Oh, so lovely, David. Happy birthday to you, Debbie. And thank you for the rest of the day. And Sherry, I'm going to look out for Whispering Angel. Whispering. And by the way, I've got to ask you, Sherry and Debbie, have you heard Dee sing lately? No. No. Oh, my Not goodness. Really. When she's doing a gig, you've got to go. This woman can tell a story and make you completely believe she's lived it. Every one of them. Oh, she, pro I she probably has, David. That's the problem. <laughs> right. Okay. David, the thing is, I, do, I tell you what, you, you are the most amazing mentor and coach That's ever lovely. in the entire universe. I am so privileged and lucky to be working with you. Well, I think. I feel the same because we're mining for gold. You've got so much in you. Oh, Dave, thank and you too, and Carrie. You and Carrie, wow. Well, we thank love you. you. We thank adore you. Darling. God bless you all. Take care. Soon, Bye, darling. Thank you. Wow. 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 Inspirational or what? So much that we didn't get in that yeah. he's going to do part two. Yes. Yes, he will. And it wasn't it great the way he. He, you know, he, he didn't, he said he wasn't confident. He was turned down by everyone, but he kept going. It's about that, isn't it? It's about keeping yeah. going. Yeah. I think the thing is today, I mean, as you were saying, with social media, that, that people that, you know, don't have enough likes or whatever, think that it's all over, but they don't realise that if you, you've got to keep on going, you, you really yeah. have to. I mean, we've all done that as actors. People have yeah. not believed in us and we yeah. just kept on going. I know, it's Absolutely. extraordinary. And who would have thought a little show that we've done like this, we ended up, you know, being nominated for one of the biggest awards on broadcast, you know, from, yes. from nothing, from a conversation. Have we mentioned that before, by the way? <laughs> no. In case people don't know, we've been nominated for an award. Very big one. <laughs> oh. Very soon, isn't it? Very, very soon, soon. Very I know. Soon. Well, actually, so I also think that Harriet and Sherry are now the same person because they're not on the same show very often. <laughs> yes, that's a good point. They've morphed <laughs> into each other. Yeah. One of us turns up and then the other doesn't. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness right, me. Well, we'll right. see you on Friday. Have you a Friday. lovely birthday. Have Thank you. Bye. Bye.